What is up, everybody? Hello. Uh, we should be live. We should all be here. You should be able to see all five of us. Um, really excited for this today. Uh, really happy. This is the very first, the inaugural meeting of Readme, the Software Developer Book know. Club. Um, and so just really pumped to have all of you here. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. I'm TJ DeVries or Tej DV on Twitch. I'll be one of your hosts going forward with uh, this event. And today we have with us Bruce Tate, the author of the book that we're going to be starting with, Seven Languages in Seven Weeks. So I want to just pass it over to Bruce. Why don't you give us a little bit of information about yourself and then uh, we'll do a round of intros for everybody. Yeah, small potatoes here. So my name is Bruce Tate. I, I am a... a author of a, a lot of technical books. This one is one of my favorites. And, and the reason is that I wrote this book, not because I knew it was happening, but because I was afraid. And um, mm -hmm. so we'll get to talk a lot about that, but thank you so much about the invitation. Right now I'm working at a small mom and pop software development center. And so we teach Elixir development. quite where that's going um we're 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 in the process of um of changing with the elixir language but we also do trainings for elixir otp and live view uh, that's that's kind of where where my heart is kind of in in the the teaching space so it's great to be here awesome bash you want to introduce yourself next hello um can you hear me Okay, cool. I keep muting my mic by accident and then trying to talk and it, it doesn't work yet for the record. Not, not how that works. Um, but hi everyone. Uh, if you don't know me already, my name is Bash Bunny. I do building in public on Twitch. I do content creation on YouTube as well and, um, post some things on Twitter sometimes, but hello, that's me. I write a lot of go. I'm currently also learning Haskell and I'm super excited to read this book and learn more about these seven languages. Awesome. Thanks, Bash. Leon? Hey, everybody. I'm Leon. Uh, I am a retired Pokemon live streamer turned tech <laughs> educator. Uh, I have been running a program with a bunch of wonderful folks called 100 Devs, where we try to help folks get their first job as a software engineer. We've helped 300 plus folks get their first jobs by going through our boot camp, which is which is wild and phenomenal. So I love the power of Twitch and the ability to learn. And so uh, I don't have a CS background. Uh, a lot of these words scare me. And so I'm really pumped to spend some time with you all uh, going deep on these different languages, understanding all the bits and bobs and hopefully bringing that into uh, what I share with folks online. So really thankful for everybody here. And, and Bruce, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, and I guess we can have Began talk as well. Hi guys. Uh, I used to stream uh, programming on Twitch. Uh, <laughs> now I trade JPEGs. I swear I'm coming back to program, but yeah, I was a late, uh, late career switcher into tech. Ruby was my first language and then spent 10 years building stuff, doing different languages, uh, streaming, learning stuff. Excited to be here and learn what the heck prologue is. So yeah, I'm just excited for Began to show off since we're going to do Ruby, his um, speed running skills at making a shopping cart in Ruby on Rails. If I recall, that was what you thought programming oh, back was. In the day, I used to literally wow. just speed run making shopping carts 10 years ago, and that's how I made my first bit of money to get myself out of retail. So Ruby's very close to my heart. So. Yeah, so so that's that's the crew. Um, Bruce is just joining us for today, so we're going to be able to ask him some questions about the book and some some different ideas there. I just want to lay out quickly what our sort of plan is for the book club, and then we'll get into the discussion. The idea is that every other Friday, so two weeks from now, we'll have read the next chapter in the book. Throughout that time, you should be building the things in the book. Don't just, I mean, you can still just show up, but you really want to participate and get the most out of the discussion. Do the things that are in the book, come prepared and come ready to talk and ask questions. And we'll all be able to bounce ideas off each other, talk about things we like, we don't like, what we learned and all of those kinds of things. And I know Bruce is going to talk a little bit uh, more about that as we go forward, but that's basically the plan. So we're going to be meeting every other Friday. Uh, don't show up next Friday. And you'll just need to read the very first chapter, which is Ruby. That's the plan. So with uh, those sort of uh, introductions and a little overview out of the way, 
Bruce, can you give us a little bit of just a brief overview first of what even is this book? Yeah, that's a that's a bit of an embarrassing question for an expected question, right? <laughs> so I wrote the book because I was just stone cold terrified for my career. Uh, I was I was watching. I'd been a Java developer for a while, and kind of pushed that as far as I could for the types of problems that I was solving. I mean, I was I was I was babysitting big fat relational databases with a web UI, and people wanted that problem set to be efficient. And so I moved to Ruby and um, loved it. And then joined a startup, um, which has long since imploded. But um, but one of the things that was happening with, with the Ruby language was it was very good at solving the problem that I initially had to solve, but it was not quite so great at these interactive problems. And, and as I started disappearing, into papers, I came across this this one that's probably probably should have been my first called the free lunch is over, and that talked about the idea that that we're cramming more and more on these these microchips. We're basically out of out of space on a piece of silicon because the um, the circuits and the insulators are just too thin in terms of the number of atoms thick. So we have to stack them up like plates in the pantry, and when you do that, it changes the way that you have to code to support them. So I was stone cold terrified for my career that that all this object oriented stuff has to, you know, it, it, it has an end game for the types of, of highly concurrent problems that I'm solving. And um, and I said, what do I do? And I started researching programming languages. And, and one of my friends said, dude, you're an author. Bring somebody with you. <laughs> I said, but I don't, even, I don't know anything about any of these languages. They said, well, bring them with you on the journey. And I think that that's why the book has kind of struck a chord. We're all terrified of the languages and the terminology in, in some of the languages in the book. Right? And, and it's, it's okay to, um, to, have that, um, to have that little bit of trepidation, but it's not an excuse to stop learning programming languages and stop evolving. So that's that's what the book is about in general. Question, actually, yeah, I love you already had written books before this one too? What was the yeah. uh, first one you wrote? Because truthfully, every book sounds so intimidating. Blog posts are hard. Like. <laughs> so um, I've been a consultant for a number of years. Um, in fact, that's another story. We'll we'll do it in another, another Twitch stream or, or something. But... Um, but the startup that I joined was in 1999, very, very end of 1999. And, and some of you are, have, that have gone through that time period you said, isn't that when the internet bubble burst? Why, yes, that is when the <laughs> internet bubble burst. And so I left a, a job of, of 13 years with IBM and, um, and, effectively was told I could always come back. Hey, you know, we, we, we'd love to have you here. The startup, the startup blows up just months after I joined. And, um, and I said, well, I can always write. So I wrote this great book, no, a great title on a terrible book called <laughs> Bitter Java. It got slash dotted before anybody ever knew what it said. And, um, <laughs> And that, that basically started my, my writing career. And so I've, I've written some books, like one of them was Beyond Java. One of them was From Java to Ruby. Um, and then, yeah, and, and this was kind of in, in um, kind of midstream in the cascade of books. These days I wrote, um, I write mostly about Elixir, but I have another book coming out that will be my first entrance in in the um nonfiction memoir we did the great loop which is a which is a trip around the eastern united states and um i'll be writing about that very cool i think the that's that's interesting that this is sort of in the middle and i love that journey of uh the unknown of what's going to happen next right and then work like just taking that sort of into your own hands in a sort of way and like finding a way to to learn more things we're we we love learning here. That's one of uh, the big things that we love we love to push. So so given you know sort of that backdrop for the book, um, I'm I'm kind of interested to know how you think we should approach it. What what does it look like for us as the reader? 
okay, I'm going to read chapter one over the next two weeks. What should I do? What's what's your number one piece of advice or a few pieces of advice about how we go from I just bought the book to I'm ready to have a really great discussion in two weeks? I would say two things. I would say the first one is don't be a slave to it. Right. So this book was written a number of years ago. I think 2010 is when the copyright is or something like that. Um, and so some of the versions, if you can't get the earlier versions of the languages, um, you're, you're going to have some you're going to have to encounter some some rough edges. Right. And some of the mm -hmm. some of the ways to solve problems. I, I, I know that um, that you're going to see the Ruby chapter and say, hey, this isn't this isn't great Ruby code. But, you know, so the first one is don't be a slave to it. The second thing is to try to solve something non-trivial in each language, because that's where the growth happens. Is that's that's where you start to break your brain a little bit, so you can put it back together with the cool new stuff inside. Yeah, that's part of the reason that we actually picked meeting every other Friday was sort of my perspective <laughs> on what we should do. Right, is like you maybe spend a week doing the chapter stuff. And then if you have time, you spend a little bit of that next week just sort of smashing your face against the keyboard with this completely new concept that you're like, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do in Ruby. And you just like try and build something. And then you just see what happens uh, next, which I think is really great. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like a lot of people, especially when they're learning something new, they feel like they need to understand it right away. It's like, okay, well, I read the chapter. I should know Ruby now. And it's like, no, no, no. Give yourself some time to like process it and digest and like, fail with it and then you'll know it a little bit better you know well, it's an ongoing thing i am putting all seven of these languages on my resume after the seven <laughs> weeks like no matter what i'm putting them on there okay so if someone wants to pay me uh also i'm super excited to see what the ruby looks like because i remember when i started ruby one thing i liked back then which i might hate now is there was regional styles i was in portland at the time and people would be like we, we would call it Seattle style when you didn't use parentheses and one guy would come in, not use parentheses because you don't need parentheses when you're calling functions. So it looks more like English. And it's like, oh, he's from Seattle. And we were like, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> different regions have different styles. And then now I'm like 10 years later, I'm like, why were we doing that? So I can't wait to see what it looks like. So if you've ever seen any Lisp, then um, then this chapter would be dinged for gratuitous use of macros, right? So of course we're talking about the, the Ruby open classes, mm -hmm. right? Uh, awesome. You know, that's that's the, the, the coolest and the scariest thing about Ruby, right? Is the mutability pertains to the class definitions themselves. Mm -hmm. 100%, yes. I see, I don't, I wanna re restrain, but guys, Ruby is awesome. Let me tell you all about it. Okay, gotta, gotta, we haven't started the book yet. <laughs> yeah, wait till next week, Vegan. We want Bruce to talk, okay? <laughs> you mentioned- Sorry, oh, go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead, Leon. You go. It's, it's going to take us a while to get used to the, <laughs> the, the, the sorry, people. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned kind of building something non-trivial. Uh, I know there's recommendations in the book, but have you seen folks build anything kind of week to week that you thought was impactful or something that was helpful? You know, when I when I talk to readers of the book, um, besides one or two, uh, you know, one or two, they they told me that they did something really spectacular. Um, but aside from that, we don't really talk about those things. Um, mostly, you know, there was when we were on this great trip. So picture yourself on this boat trip, and you're going nine months, and at least a third of that time, probably closer to half, we're in the the um, at the helm of a boat, and there's a lot of time to kind of to kind of think, and um, so as as we are um, kind of kind of crunching on these things, we will play podcasts. And in one of the um, one of the podcasts, the, the title struck me. I couldn't even tell you what it's about, but it's it's Jamar Tisby's um, podcast on curiosity. The people who don't ask questions, right? So, I think that that's really what we wind up. What all the conversations come back to is that this book touches a nerve in the community because we all um, when we're on when we're on top of things uh, we all want to be curious we all want to be kind of inspired by um, by different ideas and different concepts and and so that's what I talk about but very rarely do I talk about one thing that was that's actually been built um, you know maybe I can think about one instance 
we got a great question from the audience, which was, "What what is your favorite language from the book? Uh, that's like asking your favorite kid, right? <laughs> yeah, it's easy to pick. No, I'm just kidding. I've got two. I can't just... uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to answer that. Let me, let okay. me tell a story about um, a favorite moment, maybe the moment that the book came into focus. Yeah. So you can... So you could picture someone who's writing this as like a like a blob of research. And I'm I'm afraid. And that's why I'm writing the book. And I'm tentative about putting the ideas out there because I mean I'm I'm in a place where I don't know the things that I believe that I need to know to make my career um step forward, right? And and I've made the decision to be a little vulnerable and bring readers along with me. And so as we're as we're going through this this experience, you know, my editor team is kind of you know Jacqueline Carter at, at the Pragmatic Bookshelves, my editor. We're having conversations around this, and and by the time that we get to the third chapter, she says we need to get some reviews in here, right? I said okay, um, make it so, and so she said okay. I sent I got a review back from from this this guy. She said, this guy it turned out to be Joe Armstrong, one of the creators of the Erlang language, right? So <laughs> this terrified guy has, you know, I, 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 unbeknownst to me, the book is sent to the desk of the guy that created the thing that I'm talking about. Right? <laughs> and so the review comes back and, and he just basically, um, you know, blows through Ruby, doesn't say anything about, um, about that. He says, I get the feeling that Bruce understands Erlang very well. Not true, right? But but <laughs> I'll take it. You know, he got that sense because the sample programs that I wrote were based on the sample programs that he wrote, right? So <laughs> he's basically reading his ideas and saying, yeah, these <laughs> ideas are really good, right? This guy's a genius. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But then he said, I do not get the same sense for the prologue language. This is this is a disaster, and you need to clean this up, right? And so, um, here I am. I'm hearing the criticism, right? And, and it's as somebody who's who's afraid, and and I basically kind of kind of swallowed my pride, and I approached Joe on email, and he said, "I would love to mentor you in Prologue," which wasn't what I asked him. I asked him to, to help me fix the chapter, right? Now, what does it need? Um, and so anyway, um, he, he, he had some suggestions about a map coloring problem and I wrote that and it was pretty straightforward. Um, then he said, find something non-trivial. And I'd, I'd coded, um, you know, based on Ruby, there was James Gray wrote, a, wrote the Ruby quiz um, book. I read that and um, and he solved it. Um, one of the things that they they did in in like a programming club was to solve a Sudoku in um, in Ruby. And so I tried that in Prolog. And I said, Joe, I don't know where to go here. I've coded the rules, you know, all the the columns, rows, and um, and squares need to be the same. And he said, Well, did you try to run it? And I did, and it spit out the answer. And Joe is on the other end of the phone laughing, laughing, right? He said, you just had your first prologue moment and, you know, nothing else needed to be said. And eventually we became good friends and, and he wrote the forward for the book and basically, you know, got that, got it off the ground. So um, I would be inhuman if, if I didn't say to the answer, which do you have a favorite language? No, but I have a favorite moment and that's it. Was there anything else that you felt like came out of that situation talking with him or with those interactions? I mean, it's pretty cool that you were able to speak with like the author of one of the languages in a sense, you know, in the book. Yeah, well, I got to speak to the creators of a chunk of the languages. I think mm -hmm. six of the language creators were a couple of them were in the Has um, Haskell space. Wow. And um that was really, really cool, right? So that's the thing that came out of it. I said, well, we, we've, I got to talk to Joe about, about this early experience. So I asked him, would you mind me including that? Um, and, and I had met Matt's because he always came to Austin when I lived there for, um, for uh, Lone Star Elixir, which Jim Freeze put together and he does the Elixir conferences. 
And so we um, we knew each other, and he did it. He did um, a, an interview for for Ruby, which, um, by the way, Matt's is still my favorite language creator in terms of programming culture. Nobody's ever been able to scratch what he's done there, and um, he will always be one of my um, one of my favorite language creators, uh, just based on the idea of building a respectful, civil community that respects beauty, fun, and love. I mean, that's that's just amazing. Yeah, just yeah say, so it was my job to, as a Rubyist to we had to talk more good about Matt. So, like for instance, Tej, do you know what Mitsua means? This is what we all say as Rubyists yes. to each other. Yes, I don't Matt's know. Matt's nice, so we're yeah. Matt's is Mitsua, nice, so we're nice, right? Matt's is nice, so we're nice. Why <laughs> you're being a jerk? Well, Matt's is nice, the creator. Why don't you be nice? And it's just anyone's being a jerk. You're like, dude, Mitsua, come on now. Matt's is nice, and we're nice, and it it does spread. It's part of the culture. Like it's mm. it's genius to have a little phrase where it's easy to like not check someone, but yeah, realign saying, hey guys, we're trying to have fun here and make code. And so yeah, love it. Yeah, but those ideas are ideas that you don't see in the lines of the language specifications. So mm -hmm. you only see that if if language creators are able to open up and um, and answer these questions. And and you know they they all did the ones that I could find anyway. I was gonna say it's hilarious if someone asks you like, well, how'd you learn prologue? It seems like a hard language. Oh, private prologue lessons with Joe Armstrong, the creator of Erlang. How, <laughs> how'd you learn? <laughs> Just schedule a private lesson. It's great. <laughs> That's like when we do NeoVim tutoring with me and you, yeah, Vegan. Exactly. <laughs> I ask teach questions that are like page one of the docs from the guy who makes it. And I'm like, this is not, this is, you should not be asking <laughs> how to open a file from Matt's. <laughs> like, right, like. <laughs> right. Right. So there was another interesting moment with a language creator. Um, one of the most powerful moments of my life. Um, so basically I chased... Um, Jose Vallon, um, who created the um, the Elixir language um, across the pond, and got to see him speak, and um, and you know I I agree. I said he says I know who you are, Bruce, right? And kind of that that smooth you know Brazilian uh, accent, and um, and we hit it off, and and um, he told me that. Um, that many of the ideas in Elixir were inspired by the seven languages and seven weeks book. And um, that's, that was a big moment, right? Is um, I wrote this thing out of fear, became loved by a number of people, I think based on the fear, that very fear and vulnerability and even held up technically um, just enough, I think for, um, for somebody like Jose to be able to, to see the magic in Erlang shining through. How did that's the? Oh, go can ahead, I ben. can I comment on that first? Yeah. Uh, I just want to say that's amazing, and I think that that holds a really important lesson that there is no right time. You could have waited until you felt ready to write this book when you felt like you were an expert, but you decided to bring people along with the journey as you were learning the languages, right? Yeah, I I strongly strongly um, resonate with that with that comment. Um, so, so the idea that, that we need to be a profession full of experts is, um, is just deeply flawed. Um, so one of the things that we try to do um, when we teach Elixir at, at Groxio is um, you know, we basically have very small Zoom, um, Zoom conversations, kind of like this one, and people code and they make mistakes and then the intermediates are able to teach the beginners. The experts are able to teach the intermediates. And I can have a more successful course with a mix of skill levels in the Zoom room than I could if I had everybody being the same. Of course, it'd be, it'd be easier to write the curriculum if everybody was at the same level. But if you basically hold the curriculum loosely and say, we're going to build somebody something non-trivial, we're not going to try to check off all the features in the concepts that we're teaching. We're going to get the core abstractions and we're going to solve non-trivial problems. We're going to break and then we're going to recover. Right. If we can do that, then then that's that's a that's the best we can hope for, I think. So so with uh, Jose Valim actually like, you know, making Elixir being inspired and then with uh, I already forgot, Joe Armstrong actually mentoring you. 
did those two end up like meeting or did you like help facilitate that relationship since Elixir is so based on Erlang? So, so Jose was always going to meet Joe without me. I mean, that's, that would be an out, outdated notion. Um, I mean, my, my contribution in the Elixir, Elixir space um, was probably mostly in the adoption area and, and writing the books because um you know, good things happen when you have that publishing line, like um, like there's some cool stuff going on in the machine learning. Um, and I think without that line of books, um, that doesn't happen, that that Jose doesn't see what you know, Sean Moriarty is doing. Um, but no, I, I don't think that that um, that I facilitated that meeting. Um, Jose, um, he's <laughs> he, he's a, a very persuasive person and um, a very kind person. And those are the types of people that other people want to meet. And Joe was very much cut from the same cloth. Yeah, I'm pretty interested. How did you now like get into the Elixir space, right? Because that's like what you're doing today. Like, how did you go from like, oh, I happened to write the book that kind of like made this language happen a little bit to like now you're you're working in the space? What was that journey like? So I think that probably Jose and I were looking for the same things. Mm. And so I write about, uh, I wrote a lot about those experience, experiences. And so Jose was creating a lot of the, the, um, the Ruby frameworks that I was using and hitting certain walls in terms of abstractions. He was hitting walls in terms of concurrency, of reliability. We were having to write these, these shell scripts that monitored our programs. And, um, you know, we had, um, you know, Terrible problems with things like memory leaks because the um, you know the memory management wasn't clean. Um, the idea of these these open classes. I mean, all this happens not because Ruby is a bad language, but because it is a loved language, and we've pushed it kind of beyond where it's designed to be pushed. Right? It's that that this happens to good languages, and um, so I think that we basically encountered the same problems at the same time. And so why did I find um, Elixir? I went out looking for it, right? So I, I loved some of the concepts in the book. I liked dynamic typing um, because Ruby made me love dynamic typing. <laughs> I loved the, um, the reliability of Erlang. So I really wanted that. I, um, I am dyslexic. So um, it was a very difficult thing to wrap my head around the syntax in Prolog and Lisp with all the pair, pair matching, it just kind of blew me up. Didn't know how to organize my code around it. So um, all those things kind of kind of pushed me towards um, towards looking for something functional, right? Because the free lunch is over and all that kind of stuff, and saving languages in seven weeks. And then you would kind of kind of settle back into Ruby for a while, and then um, and then you know I saw what he was doing with Elixir, and it just it resonated, right? So um, so I asked. I asked him what he needed to make the language successful. And he said, well, right now there's only one core committer. I need to bring on a second. He's in college right now. I know who he is, um, but he's going to come out of school. There's not going to be any Elixir jobs. And um, we're going to lose him to Erlang. I can't lose Eric Meadows Johnson. So I hired him. So um, he was in um, in Sweden at the time. He came to work for for um, for a company that that I was um, in the process of building their first their first release of software. I can make it better. Um, and and it it basically kind of gave the um, the the database um, capabilities of Elixir called called Ecto. It gave them enough of a push where um, Elixir had a chance. It's funny, I remember like a lot, because I was just a Rubyist at this time, and like Elixir was like, we were having problems, right? Scaling our Ruby apps. And there was all these meltdowns back then. Because I remember like famously it came out where people were like, okay, Basecamp, how are you guys handling your Rails app? And then it came out that the rumor was they were restarting the app 500 times a day. They're like, how do you handle the memory leaks? And they go, you just restart the server 500 times a day. We do it every, and then everyone's like, oh my God. And then I remember me and a bunch of other people started saying, Maybe we should look at other languages. And Elixir was just like so appealing to Rubyists because the syntax is so close. You just have to wrap your head on this OTP thing. It was I remember just being like all of us just drooling Rubyists, being like, I want to go over there. Like that was when yeah. it was so early too. 
Yeah, it's a little bit embarrassing for me because um, I, I had a very similar experience with, with um, Ruby. I mean, we were, I am not a detail oriented person and don't want to be. <laughs> so when there are these production crashes, if I can, if I can kind of pack my way around them, I will. Um, so the idea of rather than diving in and fixing the actual memory leaks, the idea of finding this, um, this process monitor and killing it was really attractive, right? And so anyway, um, I, I, the first application that we ever released on Elixir, we did not reboot that thing at all. And I said, my gosh, is the application model for Elixir and Phoenix programming so clean? Um, it turns out that wasn't the case. I looked at our logs and it was crashing all the time. <laughs> it's just the infrastructure was taking care of what of what uh, what was happening automatically in other places. Yeah, I was going to say that actually it's Joe Armstrong. If you guys don't know, he got his PhD for his dissertation, making reliable distributed systems in the presence of software errors. That's what he's all about. Okay, we've all read his paper, right? It's fan. It's I'm joking. I've never every read night. That. Yeah. yeah, every night. <laughs> but I just love that. That is like the Erlang part of the Erlang course that goes over to Elixir. I always love this idea of like things crash or things will go wrong. We handle things going wrong. We don't make perfect systems. We're not perfect humans. When things go bad, we know how to, you know, recover. Instead. So I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's interesting. I teach a lot of OTP now. Um, and I kind of think back to the first non-trivial thing that I built was a um, like a little self-healing server that was um in the book and it's it's a game and i don't even want to say the name of the game because it's a little offensive um it's russian roulette i'm hiding my head in shame we've all built a couple of wacky things back in the day mm -hmm. yeah yeah so yeah, I, we got some interesting questions from the chat that I'd love to hear your thoughts on, which uh, one of them was, would you pick the same seven languages today as, as the first one? I know there's a seven more languages in seven weeks, right? So obviously, you, you know, you kind of got to those eventually. But for your first pass of seven, would it have been these same seven or would there have been anything you'd like to do, you know, differently in 2023? Yeah, so there's there's some interesting questions built in there. Um, so I'd like, I mean, you can't go back and 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 recreate the same conditions. Um, so essentially, the the seven languages were picked not because they were the most mentioned in the research I was doing. You know, I kind of asked my um, asked my readers what what they would like to see. We published a poll at the um, Pragmatic Bookshelf, and um, but anyway. So the idea is it's a progression from um, that went through types, that went through programming models, from um, you know from object oriented to uh, prototype oriented, which is sort of object, which has some object oriented characteristics, um, and then it it went to um, unification and prolog. But you know the the thing about that was that it was a um, a declarative language. And then the rest of them were functional, some multi-paradigm, some not, some static, some dynamic. And the last few languages had advanced features like the macro system in Lisp and the type system in, um, in Haskell. So maybe what I would have done, so one of, the, one of the cool languages in the book is called IO. It was never gonna be a super popular language but it's really interesting because it's so minimalist. And you can imagine trying to teach something with a surface area of JavaScript in seven languages for seven weeks. Mm, that's tough, right? But if I'd known that the book was gonna be as long lived as it, as it is, maybe I would have picked something like Lua that's also prototype oriented and has much less surface area and has a much cleaner um, cleaner use of, I don't know, that's, that's, that's kind, of a, um, kind of a sharper, cleaner programming model. The other, the other one I might change, um, really all of them, you want to be an exploration for people who are in 
object-oriented programming, or maybe just kind of kicking the tires in functional programming. That's kind of the way the progression is laid out. But maybe the first language, I wanted to pick something that was really easy to teach and where a lot of people were living today. And maybe if I, if I, if I had the same, if I made the same choices, the same types of choices today, that might have been Python, or maybe not. But I have a, a tremendous um, respect for, um, for for Guido in, in Python also. Um, but I think I think I like that list. I'm gonna I'm gonna stand pat with it. Yeah, I'm kind of curious yeah, well, how this. You, oh, go, go, so I was yeah, just gonna go. say he got a lot of points for saying Lua. Like you're in the you're in the right crowd for that. Uh, a lot of our audience is big NeoVim fans. NeoVim has been working on embedding Lua inside of it as its primary scripting engine and been doing lots of work in that area. And I've done a lot of work embedding uh, embedding Lua inside of NeoVim. So you know we got a lot of plus points for us. I love Lua. I think it's such a beautiful little language. So. I just yeah. happy. Vegan, you know, go ahead. Bribed, we deep bribed you for. We know. That yeah, you no. Exactly. It, if I was going to change one language. language, I'd add Lua. You know, I was like, trying to convince me to do more. Lua. Okay, Bruce. rewrite my Vim files here. Uh, right. actually, what was, was gonna... your PayPal again? You know, like. <laughs> go ahead, Vegan. Yeah. So one thing actually I mentioned too is like with all these languages, what's been the adoption for them? Like, or where did they sit in the scope of? like uh, professional languages then to now. Because even then, like Scala was uh, seemed like a much more rare thing or closure. I had a couple of friends that were like, oh, I'm, I'm looking at it. I have friends that work those jobs now. And back then they were like, there's no jobs. I have to do, I have to do JavaScript. And I just want to be a Scala. Like it seems to have progressed. So I'm kind of curious, like, yeah, what's been your view of how these languages have got adopted? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not really going to talk too much about adoption. That's really not what I was going for. Um, I mean, clearly with the with the choice between JavaScript and I.O., I picked I.O., and I think it was the right call at the time. Um, I will say that I think that one of the things that each of the 7 and 7 books tries to do is have an overarching narrative. And the overarching narrative is that there is a movement from languages like Java to functional languages, and that's driven by organization, by concurrency, and by underlying hardware design. And all those things are really, really important and will continue to push to, to push languages down that particular road. Um, if I had to if I had to do do this all again um, and maybe talk about concurrency models, Maybe one of the things that I talk about would be the structured concurrency that Brian Getz is working on in, in the Java space. It's really cool research about structural problems to, to concurrency rather than say everything's immutable, therefore there is no problem. Right? Speaking a little bit about kind of like the future you've been display, displaying here, um, you said you originally wrote this book out of fear. Is there anything that you're fearful of right now that would maybe influence uh, another book? Yes, but not in the way that you're thinking. All right. So I think that right now there's a, there's a question that all, all developers are asking a great question that's kind of, that's, that's born of curiosity. How can we, right? How can we? That's curious. That's, that's natural. That's, that's, um, you know, that's where we get our joy. There's another question that we all need to be asking is particularly as pro programming 2.0 is um, starting to crest with, with the machine learning. It's should we, should we? There's a lot of things that we don't do. Like we build data based on models that might be racist or sexist instead of trying to pick, trying to model the world that we want to live in, right? So those are the types of problems that I think are really interesting. And I, I wish that our, um, our industry, our, the, the, the way that there's, there's kind of a lack of accountability with software engineering, I wish that we were built more um, to, to more readily ask those kinds of questions. Yeah, it's tough because like I, when you're new in programming, you're trying to learn and get your career and all of a sudden you've got a job and you're at a company. I know I was at a company where all of a sudden I got asked to do some things and I was like, I think that's illegal. 
Uh, I think I've got to go somewhere else. And then if you guys want to see, there's a John Oliver episode about it. Go look up Pace and you can find out what happened to that com- that whole industry. Because, But I know other people there, they stay and they go, I need a job. I got kids. I got to pay for things. I'm not going to just leave. And there's, and I'm like, Ugh. it's scary. Yeah. You know, and it's hard when you're, when you're like not solid in your career to like stand up for those things. We got to start teaching them earlier and like, it needs to be a culture around it because like you're saying with machine learning stuff it's 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 even harder to even know what you're building they're black boxes sometimes and you don't realize that what's happening inside there is pretty dark the outputs it's giving so yeah i'm very with yeah you. that's that's actually one of the things too for people who want to stick around for book club for a while that hopefully we'll tackle in the last quarter of this year um the brief outline for what we're trying to do in book club is broad overview for this first quarter a soft skills book in the second quarter a deep technical book in the third quarter. And then in the fourth quarter, we'll do some work of fiction that will help us, you know, encounter some interesting questions about things like, should we, or what does it look like when X happens? So that's sort of, you know, we're hopefully going to explore a wide range of those things, you know, answering some of the questions about, can we, you know, can we write scalable software that's resilient, you know, on load, but also, should we do this thing and what what are the implications so really excited uh that you're bringing that up today bruce because that's definitely we're definitely on the same same page for a lot of those things which is fun yeah so there's a great talk that i saw um maybe maybe three years ago right before everything started shutting down for covid it's the last lone star elixir and the talk is from a man named randall thomas um, I think he did Ruby for a while, Engine Yard, if I'm not mistaken. And the talk was called, Yeah, But Should We? Very um, influential talk for me and um, basically talks about some of the issues. But I think that they are growing more and more pronounced with the way that social media is hacking the minds of our kids and our democracy and things like that. I'll definitely give that a watch. That sounds awesome. Also, I do love how Lone Star, there's Lone Star Elixir. It's a Lone Star Ruby. I feel like it's like everything in Ruby. There's like a Elixir version of it, you know? Every time we say Lone Star, Ruby? Oh, Elixir, never mind. Same thing. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. It's the same man. It's um, Jim Freeze put those conferences together. I think that he's he's had an outsized role in the adoption of these languages without, without, writing, um, without writing a lot of public code. Um, he was basically culture hacking, right? Which is a pretty cool thing. I have a question for you, Bruce. So I've been learning a little bit of Haskell on stream and I keep getting the question, why are you learning? Why are you learning Haskell? Why are you learning a functional language? So I'm curious why you chose to incorporate functional languages into your seven books in seven weeks. Yeah. So, so functional languages are, um, so there's two, there's two built-in questions there. And one of the, one of the built-in questions is about the structure and immutability. Right. So that's the first reason that most people are going in that direction. But the other reason um, for Haskell is basically because of the lambda, lambda calculus and the math. It's it's a beautiful language that um, that really expresses that has powerful expressions for lazy um, for lazy processing and and also the, the type system. That's um, that's basically mind blowing. Most of um, of type research for for a good long period of time went went on around Haskell. Um, and I think that um, that some other languages, like even Elixir, have concepts from Haskell that have been folded into Elixir. Like for example, the code formatter, or um, or some of the the stream processing that's in Elixir. So. Um, I think it's really important that that those are um, that those that languages like Lisp and Haskell are learned for vastly different reasons. Um, and for Haskell, I think it's the lazy processing and the type algebra. And for Lisp, it's the macro system and the idea of writing code that writes code. And I would put um, I would say that Elixir is probably more closely related to Lisp than than Haskell at this point. Kind of as a follow-on question to that, we had a question from the audience um, that I think will tail nicely with this. Do you feel like knowing and working with multiple languages at once hinders you from becoming totally fluent in any of them? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say hard no there. Um, so, so for me, I bet if we found, if, if we interviewed the most productive computer scientists in the world, the most productive programmers in the world, I bet that we would find that mental health plays an outsized role. I bet that we would find that mental health plays an outside role. And I think that that's true because we basically move forward to a place where, um, where we take a job in a successful company where we can have an outsized role in, in the adoption and the development um, at that particular company. And that pushes us into a place where we're no longer able to exercise our curiosity. And I think that that's a, that's kind of, that takes people to a dark place. I mean, if you, if you think about language creators and open source framework creators, it's kind of the path. That's the path it takes is that you're in this, this hyper creative time to a time where it, you're in hyper growth to a time where you're kind of pushed into this maintenance and you are forced to say no to things that will move your language forward to protect your old customers. And that's, that's a hard thing. So I think that for me, being able to experience multiple languages and, and, and really other things like the loop and teaching and things like that, I really have to engage myself to keep my curiosity viable to, um, to be a good person and, um, and to be an effective um, employee. Yeah, I love that. And I super think, um, even if at the beginning, sometimes it can feel maybe a little disorienting. You know, we had a few people mentioning that like switching between languages really confuses them. I think at least for me, one of the things I'm most excited about the book as well is just like as you learn new concepts, especially like some concepts exposed to you by like functional languages or other things like that, you can take those concepts and like apply them other places, even if it's not the only way to do something like that in a language. Um, I've been writing a lot of Rust lately, and it's very funny how much like functional code you can just write in Rust. And because of like the type system, you can enforce that those things are immutable or whatever. And then it, I'm like, I, I tried OCaml at the end of last year for advent of code. And I was like, oh, this is like the same. <laughs> even though they're like very, very different. I mean, they came from some similar places and whatnot, but I think that's one of the things that as you gain those skills and one of the things we're hoping to do with the book is you'll gain these new concepts and you'll kind of galaxy brain. Your brain just like starts to understand and see patterns differently, which I think is really exciting. Yeah, I think often it's funny because like someone's worth forward speeds at it great it's not a sunk cost putting time into a language you're not going to necessarily get paid to work in right like mm -hmm. concepts and stuff seep into your code into all interesting places and it's funny i literally had a revelation this last year this is so stupid oh, this is why we're going to read a nonfiction book if you guys read sci-fi it's very inspiring and it gives you amazing ideas and these authors are i'm like i'm reading a book and i'm like i have code ideas and i'm like but I'm not reading a coding book. I'm that dumb that I figured out this this year. <laughs> and now I'm like, I've got all these fun books to read. And all my sci-fi nerd friends are like, here's 40 books. So like, it's it's this idea though. It's not always about, right? Just pure, let me, you know, let me learn something. So I'm writing more code out that day. You know, detours are beautiful. Yeah, I, I would co-sign that uh, pretty strongly. And, and I I really think that the most important skill that we have is learning to learn. It's, it's the half-life mm. of the knowledge is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So we got to learn to learn. That's our job. I might have to steal that as uh, the like subtitle of our, or like subtitle of our book club. Learn to learn. I, I really like that. I might have to steal that. Sorry. I'll also quote it as you in the fine print. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably stealing it from somebody else subconsciously. So you know, don't qualify that at all. <laughs> Shout out, uh, shout out Dr. Barbara Oakley. They have uh, the Coursera course, Learning How to Learn. Really fundamental, really helps uh, a lot of folks mm. when they're first learning. We do. do you have a link for that, Leon? Yeah, I can put it in chat. Sweet. Oh, sorry. Okay, we just got uh, Bruce. So I don't know if, how familiar you are with Twitch things, but we just got a really big raid from our friend, the Primogen. He was just streaming as well. So that means all of his viewers came to just uh, hang out with us. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is uh, Read Me, the Software Developer Book Club, where we learn to learn. See, see how I already incorporated that so fast? That's, I think it's good. 
Um, today um, we have with us Bruce Tate, the author of Seven Languages in Seven Weeks that we're going to be reading over this next quarter. If you want to join, you can go and head over to uh, Bang Book Club, type that in the chat and head over to the Discord there. We'll be meeting again next, not next Friday, but the Friday after that is our next meeting. We'll be doing the first chapter, which is Ruby. And we're going to be exploring lots of different ideas. Began is so excited. He almost derailed us like five times today trying to just talk about how much he loves Ruby. So, but we'll, we'll wait for that. We'll wait for that um, for two weeks. And we're just chatting today with Bruce to get his opinions about the book and some programming ideas and, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so yeah, so that's what, that's what we've been doing. Um, we'll, we're going to be hanging out a little bit longer with Bruce today. Um, so feel free to join the Discord. Sign up for notifications, all that good stuff. It's got a wide range of languages, probably some uh, that you've never seen before. So it really should help you learn some new concepts and some new ideas. So the sorry, next... sorry. I... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Is... When it gets back to the advent of code, okay, then everyone needs to use a language every different day. Okay, Ruby, IO, Prolog, oh. Scala, Erlang, Closure, Haskell. Seven days in a row. That's the challenge. We have all, you have all the way till next year to pr practice though. I like but... that. That would actually be really fun. Yeah, that'd be really fun. I'd go, this is so much fun, guys. Ruby. And then I do IO. I'm like, guys, I'm sick. I got a cold. I, I'm going to sit this <laughs> out. But great idea. Have fun with it. And then I'll, I think that's the only one I would be able to do, truthfully, offhand. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like a worthwhile disclaimer to make as well. Um, because we're talking, we're on the topic of learning how to learn. Um, for those of you who are like, maybe as Bruce mentioned, how big of a role that mental health plays, especially when you're doing something that just takes such a toll on um on your uh how do i even say this something that's just very mentally challenging okay it's very hard to do that when your mental health is not in a good place and also if your environment is not conducive to a healthy learning environment if you have a lot of stresses you know at home and, and things like that um just be patient with yourself okay we're doing this book club uh we're meeting every two weeks so we're trying to pace it so that everyone can kind of follow along but if things are difficult for you, it's okay to share that. We're all going to be very transparent about how we're going through all of it. So, you know, just, just putting that disclaimer out there, it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay if uh, you're not getting it at the same pace as everyone else. Um, it's all valid. You're doing great. Just do what you can. And we appreciate you all showing up. Yeah, and that's like one of the big things about doing this together as a community. It's so difficult. I, I don't know if anyone else has this problem. I've started a lot of technical books. There have been less that I've finished. <laughs> um, and so, so I think, you know, this kind of idea of working with it together, this regular meeting where we're having fun, and if you get stuck on something, hopefully we can sort of work through that together or we can still get some insight from those things even if you're even if you're stuck you know it's okay you don't have to come to book club with all the answers that's what book club is part of about we're going to explore it together so uh, just like bash said if you feel like oh i didn't read the book or i didn't get enough or whatever that's okay come and hang out we'll learn some things anyways we need to start yeah. building our own uh, acronyms for like yeah matsu like what's ours like it's okay oh. if you don't know stuff like come learn like we need to we got to think of those. We got to we got to come ready with some of those. <laughs> we are taking applications for fun <laughs> acronyms go. and phrases. You know, like let us know what you think we should be using, because uh, that that'll be really fun. Well, that's yeah, the, I, the first way to sound smart. So if you know the acronym, C said Elixir said OTP, and you're like, Began knows what's up. I can't describe you exactly what OTP means, but I know the <laughs> acronyms. Yeah, I think I think that's something really interesting. We're gonna have like a, such a wide range of skill sets and experiences. And that's what I'm most excited about, because a lot of these languages I haven't touched before. A lot of the words that have been said, I, I don't know. Right. And so being able to do that together in a space where we're all learning together and sharing resources and coding things, together, I think that's really, really exciting. So if you're somebody that is kind of more in like uh, early career dev, I think you get a lot out of it. And if you're mm -hmm. somebody more senior, you'll get a lot out of it, too. And the discussions that we'll have to highlight all those things and I don't know. I think it's such a, it's really important. Like when I think about the books that I've read, this book is something I wish I would have explored earlier on to know the different pieces that can inform the rest of my career. So I think if you're somebody that's just joining us today and you haven't maybe done a 
deep dive into a technical book before, this is a really great one to start with. And I'm glad y'all are here. Can I give people a little bit of homework? Yes. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Here's the homework. And, and not before next book club, but before you die. Here's your homework. So each, each language in the book is, um, has, you know, one of, the, one of the problems I had to solve was that when the user goes or when the reader goes from page 48 to 49 and there's a transition between programming languages, what do I do? Right. How do I, how do I bring the user along? Well, the, 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 the tool that I, I incorporated in the book to solve that problem was associating each programming language with a movie character. And before you die, you have to watch the seven movies um, associated with those characters. Oh, I like that. I like that. That'll be fun. Okay, so let's, Maybe so we'll we... do some watch parties. We have yeah. that capability on Twitch uh, to actually watch movies together. So maybe at some point we'll have to watch. Maybe we'll do a vote and when we're all the way done and pick which one people want to watch the most. That would be fun. Oh, what you should do, Teach? Um, yeah. You should you should basically show one tiny representative clip at the mm. beginning of the Twitch stream. <laughs> that's, that's genius. A, I'm writing that down right now. Wait, that's a good idea. But also, wait, wait. I don't know who these the stars are yet. So before we get to each chapter, I feel like we got to have a poll of everyone else. Who, what character they think each language should be, and then we'll <laughs> yes! see who you put it. So oh, start with Ruby. Great. So we got to yes. have a poll going of. Who is Ruby in a movie character? I got which I that, right. That's what we're trying to describe, right? Yeah, it's any movie. Okay, so we're, yeah, we'll yeah. see who the crowd picks, and then we'll see who you picked, and then we'll we'll pull a clip from them. That sounds fun. Yeah, before you start the chapter, pick your movie character based on your perception of what the language is. I love that. I love it. Mine is perfect. You will not top mine. <laughs> okay, good. Oh, you got good, Twitch chat right there. They're competitive, so I can't wait to see what they come up with. They're going to be mm -hmm. digging in obscure archives of look at this character. <laughs> Are we going to have Bruce on again at the end so that we can yes. kind of let him know what all of our characters were? And then that would be really fun. Tell him, tell him the overarching uh, theme of how we all felt during the book. That would be great. Yeah. It, Bruce, that. it looks like we got thumbs up from you. That sounds good. I'm in. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I think though, we're just at about, about time for what, for what we said we were shooting for. Uh, we got a lot of new people in. Uh, right now. So maybe though, Bruce, you can just give us sort of some parting words about maybe particularly the book and then also just some parting words for beyond the book, but also maybe just like life as a software developer. How about just two words? Be okay. curious. <laughs> Be curious. I love it. Yes. Operate from a place of curiosity, not fear. And then nothing feels overwhelming. It's all just exciting. <laughs> we are the people who like questions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think one of the great things about being curious too, right, is uh, it's it doesn't have to, it, it applies to everybody at all the stages, right? Oh, it's your first time opening up a code editor, or you've been doing this for for you know twenty, forty years, or whatever it is. You can you can still be curious. You can still be exploring. That's why we're here. That's the Love point you, of the book club. <laughs> so, anyways, thank you so much, Bruce, for uh, coming on with us. Uh, anybody have anything else they want to say quickly before we head off? Otherwise, we'll see you in the Discord, and we'll see you in two weeks with the first chapter. You only have to do one chapter. You don't need to do the whole book. Just the first chapter done with Ruby and uh, your movie character suggestions as well. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. I think there was there was a question in chat that is so typical for from us. Um, mm. People are asking what your favorite editor is. Oh, great question. <laughs> They're You're demanding right. to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I so I really love TextMate from way back, and um, so. Even when I use when new editors pop up, I try to find the old TextMate settings. Um, but yeah, so I'm using Code now, and I think it's it's a really good product, and and it fits my workflow pretty well. Awesome, that's great. Thanks so much for answering that. I know that mm -hmm. everyone's very curious about that always. So <laughs> yeah, people are always wondering uh, wondering on stream. So that's great though. 
Cool. All right. Well, with that, we'll see everybody in two weeks. Um, just one more shout out for everybody else on stream today. We've got Bruce. You can buy the book, uh, type bang seven langs in the chat, and you'll be able to get the link to go buy that book or find it at a local bookstore. We've got Bash Bunny here, excellent streamer, go aficionado, Cly Pomodoro Master. Go check out her YouTube and her Twitch. We've got Leon with us here, master and leader of the 100 devs, bringing so many new devs into their first job. Very exciting. Uh, Leon's got a great Discord where you can learn a lot more about 100 devs and what they're doing and how to start with software. And we've got Began, who keeps saying he's going to keep start streaming again. Any day, any day now. Any day now, any day now. One of my beloved online friends, one of my favorite people on the internet. Um, so really happy to have Vegan here with us as well. And so with that, we're going to uh, sign off. We'll see everybody in two weeks. Thank you so much for your time. I'm. Uh, we'll pick somebody to raid really quickly so that we can send you off. And then who do we have here? Ooh, we've got Edward. Nice. We've got an O-Cameler. We're going to go raid we him right now. Oh, that's rare. This is <laughs> We've great. got an O-Cameler right Amazing. now. We'll see what Eduardo's up to today. He was very helpful to me when I was learning O-Cameler. So we got to send we got to send everybody his way. Um, Egan, so are you going to teach everyone how to use how to create shopping carts in Ruby for the first time? Oh, I'm going to I'm going to show you speed running. I'm going to show you my techniques. We're going to have golden splits. I'm going to I'm going to really teach people. I'm, I'm going to start warming up. So, yes, you better stream it. Otherwise, oh, I will, I will. <laughs> you're kicked right. out of book club. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. I will try and upload this to YouTube soon. We will try and send this on different podcast platforms as well and all the good stuff so you can listen to it, share with your friends. Uh, the more the merrier. We love all of you. Be curious and let's learn to learn together. See you later, everybody. Bye-bye. Peace. Bye.